Good morning. I would like to welcome you to the regular public meeting of the Henry County Board of Commissioners for 9 a.m. Monday, October 18, 2010. At this time, I would like to call the meeting to order. Before I ask for an acceptance of the agenda, I would like to make the following announcement. The following item has been postponed until further notice and will not be heard at this meeting. ULDC-AM-10-09, an ordinance by Henry County, Georgia, to amend Chapter 7, Section 7.04.07F, Special Limitations, Entrance and Subdivision Signs, in accordance with Section 12.02.11-12.03.00 of the Henry County Unified Land Development Code. If you are here in regards to this particular item, it will not be heard today, and if it is to be brought back before the Board, it will be advertised for a future meeting. With that announcement being made, at this time I would ask for an acceptance of the agenda. Salute. Motion by Mr. Basler, second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The first item on the agenda this morning is a presentation by Shane Thompson, owner of Shane's Rib Shack. Good morning. Good yes. Morning. I didn't know I was bringing a presentation. I, I kind of <laughs> slacked up on that a little bit. <laughs> but uh, and now I know how people feel when they go before Congress. and Look at all this. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, we do, with Shane's Rib Shack starting in Henry County, I'm always trying to get back to the county that's really put us on the map. Um, even though we have lots of stores in other states, this county is where I live. It's special to me. And I was talking with uh, Mr. Basler about doing something. We always do small things, you know, for the fire, uh, police. Sometimes we get other county workers are upset that they didn't get anything. So this Christmas, we were going to try to do like a gift certificate, like a $10 gift certificate that could be distributed to every employee just to kind of give back. It'll be, um, you know, just redeemed at one of our stores. And I really wanted to ask permission because it is a large value um, to do that. If there's 1,700 employees, there'll be a $10 value plus the distribution of them because of that. I would need some help to make sure every employee got one. But I think it's important um, that every worker in the county gets appreciated, not just sometimes different segments. Um, so I was coming here to ask permission to be able to do that. Well, I, I want to say how much we appreciate your generosity to the county. Time and time again, when we've had events and things, you've always stepped up to the plate and been very generous and, and, and helpful in, in those things. And um, I'm very appreciative. I'm sure the other board members are as well. And I guess I asked the county attorney, do we have to, do we need to accept this by formal motion? I would think that just as you do with any other donation, you can make a formal acceptance of the donation. Yes, ma'am. All right. And before I ask for a formal motion on that, would any other board member like to make a comment? Mr. Bowman? I would like to say that I, I really appreciate Shane's doing it. I know they've done, you've done a lot for it the FCA and a lot of the other groups that come to you and uh, to your restaurants and uh, uh, he's been very supportive of, of, of everything that I've heard of in the county uh, from the Christian organizations to the sports organizations to and and now to the, the county employees I think that's awesome and uh, I just um, on behalf of myself uh, I, I'd like to say that uh, we really appreciate it because you know giving back is, is it's not something that happens regularly with the county, and we appreciate it when the businesses do that. Anyone else? Mr. Holder? I'd like to echo some of the things that Commissioner Bowman said, too. And, and Shane, I think it uh, speaks volumes in the fact of, that you want to be fair to all employees and, and to give everybody an opportunity also because you have been very generous, more than, than normal, to give back to various organizations throughout Henry County and to see that all of the employees got something I think uh, certainly shows it's coming from your heart and thank you. Shane, I'd just like to say first of all, thank you for doing that. That's a huge gift you're giving back to all the employees of the county and I don't know if a lot of people realize too that the last couple uh, picnics that we have you've actually participated those uh, very generally so thanks for doing both of those too. Mr. Basler. I know Shane had called us and had talked to me about um, the picnic, and I said, well, the way the budget was and some of the other things, we was kind of 
uh, reluctant to do that or a little bit hesitant to doing that. And he, one of his deals was was come up with this to to uh, to give back to the employees. And I think it's a blessing that one of our own Henry Countyans would come to the plate who has been successful in what they do and want to give back to the community. And uh, there again, thank you, because it means not only something to this board, but you take employees, that's, and I refer to them either whether they be in the police cars or in the trucks. For them to get something back means, means a great deal to me as it would this board. So thank you for what you do, and God bless you. I would echo what, what my uh, colleagues have said. I think Shane's has an outstanding reputation in the community for its community service as well as the quality of its product. And uh, this is one more example of that. Would a board member like to make a motion to accept the donation? I have a motion by Mr. Basler, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? The motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, who do I need to get with about that? Um, who would be that? Angie, Angie, Angie Bailey. I'll come see you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a proclamation in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. And here today to receive the proclamation is Don Harkins, Executive Officer, Joe Hambrick, Supervisory Traffic Management Specialist. Betsy Jones, the Administrative Officer, and Bill Kaufman, Manager of Technical Operations. And if, you're, if um, these individuals are here, if you'd like to step up to the podium, I'd like to read a proclamation. <clears throat> this is in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the FAA Atlanta Center. Whereas the Federal Aviation Administration Atlanta Center recently celebrated its 50th anniversary, having opened its doors on October 15, 1960 in Hampton, Georgia. Whereas the Federal Aviation Administration provides crucial air traffic control and other services to ensure the safety of our airways, planes, pilots, travelers, and citizens throughout the southeastern region of the United States. And whereas the FAA facility oversees more than 8,000 flights every day over Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, including all flights in and out of two of the top five busiest airports in the world, Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport in Atlanta and Charlotte-Douglas International Airport in North Carolina, and whereas the center is an integral part of of the Henry County economy by employing 829 staff who provide services 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year in a variety of highly skilled positions, including but not limited to air traffic control, information technology, support, logistics, and instruction. And whereas the FAA Atlanta Center has expanded throughout the past 50 years as air traffic has increased and is now undergoing a major construction renovation to ensure that its outstanding service record is maintained while providing ample room for growth. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Henry County Board of Commissioners wishes to express its congratulations and sincerest appreciation to the Federal Aviation Administration Atlanta Center for providing critical air traffic control services for our nation and for being an outstanding corporate citizen that has been a vital part of the community and Henry County's economy for 50 years this 18th day of October 2010 by the Henry County Board of Commissioners. And uh, we greatly appreciate you being here today and the opportunity to present this to you. And I didn't know if any of you had a comment that you would like to make before we do the formal presentation. We just wanted to thank you for uh, doing this. Um, I've been here 21 years, but I did want to recognize these folks of 40 plus years in Atlanta Center. So they've been in the community quite a while. We thank you for that. Thank you. And if you uh, would like to step over here, we'd like to make a formal presentation.
The next item on the agenda is a presentation by the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. And who is going to be coming forward to make that presentation? Madam Chair and Commissioners, this is Chief Stacy Cotton. He's one of the past presidents of the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. Madam Chair, Commissioners, good morning. How are good you? Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come uh, before you today, not only representing my city of Covington, one of your neighbors down the road here, but um, representing the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police as the past president. Um, I do I do get the pride and honor of saying the plaques I'm promoting or giving to you today I actually have my signature on them because when they achieved this award I was I was still the president of the association but again it's indeed an honor to be here um, every not every agency in the state of Georgia or around this country um, has the opportunity nor the wherewithal to go out and get have themselves uh, reviewed and say open the doors and let somebody else come in and, and especially peers of professionals across uh, the law enforcement spectrum to take a look at what it is that they do. Henry County Police Department was one of those people that say we want to be uh, cut above the average law enforcement agency and through the state certification program they met over a hundred different uh, standards that we believe in the state of Georgia are critical to be to be considered a professional police department. They did this, they were reviewed and the findings came back that they met all uh, of the areas of compliance that uh, promote them as a uh, professional police department. Personally, that is something that I've been knowing for quite a while. I've been very fortunate um, since about two, uh, 2001 to be an adjunct professor for Mercer University. So since the campus next door opened up, I've been coming to Henry County um, you know, quite often. And when you're sitting there teaching criminal justice classes, the students who are your citizens and sometimes I've had citizens from other, other communities, they'll tell you a lot about their police departments. And I can honestly sit here and tell you that I've never heard a complaint out of your citizens about the level of service that the Henry County Police Department provides. And that backs up the awards that I'm giving today, that they provide um, effective, efficient, professional law enforcement services to the citizens of your county, which is something I know that you're proud of. So if you'd allow me to read the um, read this certification plaque to you, it's State of Georgia Law Enforcement Certification. Be it hereby known that the Henry County Police Department has fully demonstrated its commitment to law enforcement excellence by meeting all applicable standards and as established in the State of Georgia Law Enforcement Certification Program. Therefore, upon recommendation of the Joint Review Committee of the State of Georgia Law Enforcement Certification Program, this agency is hereby recognized as a certified law enforcement agency for the period of July 31st, 2010 through July 30th, 2013. Signed by me, the President of the Georgia Association. Chiefs of Police and Governor Sonny Perdue. This time I'd like to um, present the plaque to uh, Chief Nichols. Chief, congratulations. Thank you very much. Great Appreciate job. It. Also, I'd like to make a recommendation, uh, recognition of that we know that not every, that the people that actually do the nuts and bolts work, the people behind the scenes are obviously the ones that um, who need the recognition um, the most. It takes the leadership of the chief to say, here's the direction we want to go in. It takes the men and women of the entire department to make this program a success. But it usually takes a per one person who has it all saddled on their back to make sure that the uh, process is done. And that certification manager, we'd like to give them a, a certificate of appreciation also because of the hard work that they do, usually out of, out of sight and out of mind of everybody else. And if I could, I'd like to ask uh, jo Officer Joe Henson to come, come forward and let me present him with a certificate. Thank you again for the honor to be here this morning, and congratulations for, uh, for this achievement for your agency. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments, too, just to, um, to say how proud our board is of this police department and, and what you do each and every day to keep our citizens safe. But I want to make sure our citizens understand that this achievement is no small achievement, and it was actually three years in the making. It's a badge of honor because this distinction is held by fewer than 100 departments um, and sheriff's offices out of 743 policing agencies in the state of Georgia. And uh, this status means that our police department maintains the highest standards of conduct, service, administration, and operations. 
and it indicates an extraordinary commitment to the safety both of our community and our officers through the effective implementation of sound policies and procedures. And I would like to thank the entire police department for the work they've put into achieving this status, certainly to commend Chief Keith Nichols, Officer Joe Hensley, um, who has been the state certification manager since 2008, and also to thank training administrative assistant Christina Henderson for um, her service and dedication to ensuring that Henry County achieved this status. So it was um, uh, once more um, a, a great example of teamwork on the behalf of uh, the entire department and um, certainly proud of each and every one of you and wanted to say congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And it's, it's an honor for me as chief to accept this award, especially knowing the roots of this department and how it was formed uh, almost 20 years ago and coming from the uh, ranks of patrolmen to see where we're at now is just phenomenal. Um, I appreciate the leadership that the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police and chiefs like Stacy Cotton uh, provide to us. And I also want to thank uh, the, the men and women of the board because without your support, uh, we couldn't accomplish what we set out to accomplish and also the county manager. Uh, Y'all stood behind us and gave, gave your support. But first and foremost, the, the men and women of our department. Um, sometimes I, I'm, I don't know if the county really knows how lucky they are to have these great men and women that come to work and every day and put their lives on the line. And I am grateful for it and, and lucky that we have these men and women. And I uh, appreciate what uh, Shane has done for them because sometimes they don't get thanked enough. But uh, uh, thank you again, and I'm very honored to accept this award. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, would y'all like to have a photograph? Sure. The next item on the agenda is under public safety, a resolution requesting award of a bid to purchase five new ambulances and to remount two ambulances presented by Brad Johnson, Division Chief of Operations, and that's exhibit number one. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. In front of you is a resolution of executive summary for replacement ambulances. Um, we're requesting purchase of five new units and a remount of two uh, as part of our capital uh, request this year. Uh, these ambulances are replacement, as I said. They're uh, the ones that are in service now, uh, the older units. Um, we were looking for six new units, but with a price cut of being remounting two units, we can remount two units and actually save money and, and get one additional uh, chassis out of it. Do any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? Um, yeah. Mr. Holder? Chief Johnson, yes, sir. What, type, uh, what brand of chassis are we talking about? This would be a Dodge chassis. We looked at all the chassis with the fleet management personnel, Jody and his crew. The Ford we have now, the F 450s, uh, we're not holding up. We looked at the Chevrolet, which the 4500 chassis we went with two and a half years ago was an outstanding chassis, but they stopped production of that plant, of that type chassis. So the one that came more, more favorable for us would be the Dodge 4500 uh, heavy duty with a Cummins uh, motor. We did look at the, the medium duty international with about $30,000 increase per unit on chassis just for a heavy duty unit that 
that up. Okay. That, that's, I just didn't see where it was specified as far as, okay, but it's a Dodge with a Cummins. Yes, sir. Also, the, the box would be the same box we're using now. It is a remountable box. One thing we want to give is a consistent size, consistent configuration for the guys to have, to have a, the same setup on every unit they're on, and that way it is remountable. Uh, the box will be remountable when we get ready to change chassis out in the future. Any other questions or comments? If not, you have before you a resolution. You will note that there is um, the award for the custom truck and body works for the new units, also to the same company for the remount of the units, but also there are two um, assets declared to be of no further use, and this resolution also authorizes those to be used as trade-in for new equipment. And with that being said, I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion by Mr. Holder and a second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to public works, we have a resolution requesting award of a bid to install 13 methane gas monitoring wells, convert an existing facility, and connect to existing soil vapor extraction system. Terry McMickle, Public Works Division Director, will be our presenter. That's exhibit number two. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Board Members. This is exactly that award of a bid to install 13 methane, methane gas monitoring wells and convert one existing one to a soil, back, a soil vapor extraction system. This is, uh, came about as a result of uh, EPDs and monitoring our extraction system that's currently going on at Windy Hill. Uh, they would like to see these additional monitoring wells as well as a conversion of one. There's one particular spot uh, some collection of gas, and they want to put an extraction system there to uh, remove it and hook it into the existing system. We sent out uh, 17 bids. We had seven vendors reply, and we recommend award to uh, geotechnical and environmental consultants in the amount of $19,950. Terry, is there any federal funds that we can apply for to reimburse the county? As I think we've done some of that in the past. We have, and Michael's probably been probably uh, any federal. Michael, they're talking about federal dollars for where we got some help in the past on our landfills. Right now, the Hazardous Waste Trust Fund um, it hasn't been fully funded by the state as of yet. We've submitted the. Um, request in to hazardous waste, trend, um, hazardous waste Trust Fund. We've submitted in. We haven't heard any word back. We're still waiting to hear word back from the state as to whether or not they're going to fund that that um, uh, that particular entity yet again. I mean, in the past we've received, oh gosh, probably at least over a hundred, close to two hundred thousand dollars in the past we've received. You know, so we're, we feel fairly confident. It takes some time because they're just waiting to see what what funding is going to be available from the state. But um, Work with Michael Tony, he's the director of um, DOT. We put the application in, and so we're waiting here back from the state. So hopefully we will know something more sooner than later. How long has that landfill been closed? Oh, uh, I think it was closed in the 80s. Do you have any idea how much money we have spent? on that particular landfill trying to mitigate all these things. On Windy Hill, I know that last system was about two fifty, three hundred thousand. About two hundred fifty thousand the soil vapor extraction system at um, West Asbury. That of course that doesn't include how many times we've hauled dirt and leveled it back up and planted grass and the maintenance of it, but that's I guess part of it. Yeah, I guess that just sort of shows that we need to be looking at things other than landfills for taking care of our um, trash in the future. We need to really start thinking about how we need to handle those things and going forward. Not just, I know we don't have any in Henry County currently, but I just think we need to rethink the way we handle our trash. So, And um, hopefully we'll see some new technologies cropping up that will help us deal with some of those issues. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? If not, you have a resolution before you, and I'll entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Stamey. Okay. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you.
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Board Member. Moving on to planning and zoning, the first item is a resolution requesting a warrant of a bid for roll-up and ADA door maintenance services. Our presenter is Mike Keevil, Directory of Facilities Maintenance, and that's exhibit number three. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here to request the award for the roll-up and ADA door maintenance service contract. The current contract will expire on October 22nd, and having a contract for the roll-up doors and ADA doors allows for quick access to this service without necessarily the necessity of bidding it out each time we need a, a door repaired. And it guarantees the prices, and these prices will remain in effect for three years. Proposals were requested through the Purchasing Department and the Henry County website. We sent it out to seven vendors, and we had one vendor respond. The funding for these services are available through the Facilities Maintenance Budget. Um, we're recommending Atlanta Professional Door Incorporated, and this will be a unit-based contract with no fixed quantities and the prices will remain firm for three years. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? If not, you have a resolution before you and I'll entertain a motion. Okay. Motion by Mr. Stamey, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. The next item is a public hearing. Request to amend Chapter 2, Table 2.03.03 .03 in cross-referencing sections regarding social, cultural, or religious assembly uses of the Unified Land Development Code. Our presenter is Michael Harris, Planning and Zoning Services Division Director, and Sherry Hobson Matthews, Planning and Zoning Director, Exhibit Number 4. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Board Members. And we're, Sherry and I are going to kind of go back and forth on these. Um, the first item is... As mentioned, um, social, cultural, religious assembly uses. Back on, and again, back to reiterate, September 15th, board adopted Unified Land Development Code. We came back on October 4th in the workshop meeting to discuss some of the issues that have been brought forward to the staff regarding this particular item. Um, we've gone through and Working with staff, we proposed a the new amendment which would create a provision to allow the aforementioned social, cultural, religious assembly uses as conditional uses within the M1 and M2 zoning districts and to update all the references as they appear throughout the ULDC. Um, as you can see in your handout, staff has come up with amended language and one issue I want to make reference to, particularly Commissioner Holder, you made the issue um, regarding the parsonage, and that has been addressed in Section E, where it states that ancillary and accessory uses for religious facilities are not permitted within the M1 and M2 zoning districts. So that would alleviate um, the need for having to have a parsonage within those industrial areas. However, it would still remain in effect for those areas where churches outright, there are still a set, a set of supplemental standards that are requirement for churches. Now, in this case, if a church is opts to go into a industrial area, they would do so and they'd be held to the standards as identified on the, um, within, that, within that commercial industrialized area. If it's a standalone church, they'd still be bound by the supplemental standards for the standalone church. And again, we mentioned last time was there are separate standards for churches by themselves. In this case, we felt it was appropriate that if it's, if with, when they go through for the conditional use, if, the, if it is the, the choice of the board, in this case, probably the, likely the zoning advisory board, to grant the conditional use, then those additional supplemental standards would not come into effect. So they'd be bound by those standards within the um, industrialized area. In essence, what we're saying is a conditional use is required. However, an additional variance would not be required unless the board would like to add those additional supplemental standards as a variable item. And I hope I haven't convoluted this too much. Does any board member have a question or comment? Yes. Mr. Holder. I just want a clarification because this applies to a church that goes into the M1, M2 zoning classification as far as residents, and that's what we had addressed in the that's previous correct. meeting. But it, it is prohibited now. That's, that, that's correct. Yeah, if it's a standalone church that's in the middle of a M1 zone, then the ancillary and accessory uses it is allowable. Is that correct? Yeah, anything from RA to RM, um, we make that, and that, that's made, that's specified. Religious facilities, including churches and other places of worship, with specified accessory uses and structures are permissible with an approved condition of use in the following zoning districts, subject to the standards of the district 
and the supplemental standards set forth in this section, and those are for areas in RA, R1, R2, 3, 4, 5, RS, RD, RM, and, and, yeah, and RM, and uh -huh. but not in the M1, M2. And all of this would require a conditional use? That's correct. Okay. Mr. Bowman? Hey, so, and I'm just, I'm just going to ask the same question. Mm -hmm. it, so a church wants to go into an M1 and M2, it will require a conditional use? That's correct. Is that correct? That's, that's what we're proposing today. Okay. Mr. Stane. Michael, does the, um, the appearance standard for commercial industrial buildings still stay in effect it does. with the zoning or with the conditional use? With the conditional use, they have to meet the appearance standards for those commercialized build buildings. Now, a church may be um, all, one of the supplemental standards for a church is building materials would be brick, stone, stucco, or glass. Now, for if it's a church located in an industrial, an industrial area, all the building materials do not have to be brick, stone, stucco. They can have obviously metal sides and typically a brick facade or some kind of decorated, decorated facade that's facing the public street. That would still be in place. So whatever the conditions are for that industrial building, that's what they'd be bound by, not the additional supplemental standards for the church. So they would not have to, in order for a church to be located within an industrial building, they would not have to meet all building materials being brick, stone, stucco. So in other words, whatever standard for that zoning, if it's M1 and M2, those conditions would still be in effect. It wouldn't be modified to do it under conditional use if a church was to apply for one, correct? That's correct, unless they want to add additional conditions on the conditional use, but we wouldn't, we likely wouldn't recommend that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Holder. Michael, we focused on churches and religious organizations, and just below it is, of course, lodges and event facilities. Mm -hmm. Now, are we treating lodges and uh, event facilities differently than we are religious and church activities? Because we are not allowing any, anybody to, to, in their ancillary and accessory uh, uses, to basically have a residence. Well, what about the lodges and event facilities? Is it allowed? As a conditional use in M1 and M2, they would be. The lodges, um, and again, the other, the other types of uses that we spoke, lodges and event centers, um, in this case, are permissible in MU, ONI, C1, C2, and C3, <clears throat> subject to the site standards for that district. Lodges and event centers are permissible with an approved conditional use within the M1 and M2 zoning districts, subject to the standards of the zoning district in accordance with, again, section 4.0103, appearance standards for commercial industrial buildings. So we're saying the same thing. They'd have to meet the standards for the, the appearance standards the Commissioner Stanley spoke of that are already stated for commercial industrialized buildings, but um, and they, they also need to have the same conditional use that, they, that a church would be required to have. So right now they're not they're not allowed outright in M1 and 2. We're saying they could be allowed only with the conditional use. I understand. Just I don't know how you can treat one differently from the other. That's my point, and, and you're saying you're not. Is that correct? That's correct. That's right. We wanted to make sure that we were looking at this entire section, not just churches, not just event centers. And again, this covers churches, event centers, civic centers, aquariums, museums, and other uses as noted in the ULDC. Any other questions or comments? If not, this was advertised as a public hearing, and I know we have one citizen who would like to speak in regards to this particular um, modification or amendment, and uh, we have Vicki Vanderhoek who signed up to speak. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, um, I'm here specifically for the building that I own. It's 6,800 square feet office warehouse at 1200 Meredith Park Drive and that's two miles west on 155. And I'm also here uh, to speak hopefully on behalf of other landlords that are in the same situation I am. This building's been vacant for three years. I have the tax assessor coming down on me. I have huge amount of taxes to pay. I can't get it rented. I have been working with Michael Harris since August 20th, trying to get a conditional use permit, which I greatly appreciate the way he d has it worded. I've been on two commercial websites, CoStar and LoopNet, for the last three years. 
I do Craigslist update every two days to be right on top. I have a sign on my building. And the only, per, the only group that wants to rent my entire building at this time is a church. And like I said at the workshop meeting, I'm not here advocating that landlords change their buildings to different uses because none of us want to do this. We're just in a situation at this moment, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, that we have lack of um, tenants out there. And since my tenants are mainly churches, that's why I talked to Michael Harris, that's why I'm encouraging a conditional use permit, but I'm sure there's other landlords out there that are getting the same type of phone calls I am, not necessarily for churches, but maybe retail getting something that is a different standard than what they have. And I'm hoping that you'll be leniency and allow conditional use permits at this time. And I believe that's all I have to say, and I'd like to appreciate it that you're allowing me here to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in reference to the amendment of this item? Does any board member have any additional questions or comments? Not you have before you a resolution to amend this section of the ULDC code as it pertains to social, cultural, or religious assembly uses and for other purposes, and I'll entertain a motion. Motion, motion to approve by Mr. Bowman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Rowark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing. Request to amend Chapter 4, Section 4.03.31, Industrialized and Modular Buildings of the Unified Land Development Code. And that is going to be Exhibit Number 5. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, as Michael previously indicated, um, Michael and I came before the Board in October um, to discuss some text amendments that had been brought to us um, either via code enforcement or just issues um, obtained from citizens. So the request before you this morning is regarding industrialized and modular buildings. Currently, the Unified Land Development Code only allows industrialized or modular buildings in the residentially zoned properties. So if you're in an ONI, C1, C2, C3, or any of, of the M1 and M2 uses, you would not be allowed to have an industrialized building. Um, while we realize that that may not work for a number of the buildings that are being constructed, um, staff has decided that this is worthy of amending our ordinance. So what we want to do is to create a provision which would allow industrialized or modular buildings in the ONI, which is the office institutional, all of the commercial zoning districts, and all of the industrial districts, and it would still be subject to all of the applicable zoning um, standards, the supplemental standards, and it, all of those buildings would have to be reviewed by the Architectural Review Committee. Um, planning staff has recommended approval of this amendment. Does any board member have a question or comment for Sherry? Mr. Bowman? Just a clarification, Sherry, the, uh, it, it would have to match whatever was in that particular development, regardless of what it was. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Stamey? No. All right. If, um, if there are no further questions from the board at this time, I'd like to see if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on the amendment to this particular ULDC code. All right. If not, if there's no further questions from the board, I'll entertain a motion. Approve. Motion to approve by Mr. Bowman. Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. The next item is a public hearing or request to amend Chapter 7, Section 7.03.01, Temporary Structures and Uses During Construction of the Unified Land Development Code. And that's going to be Exhibit Number 6. Hello again. The proposed amendment um, regarding the temporary structures on construction sites, um, what we're proposing is the amendment would allow for temporary buildings rela um, related to a subdivision development to be utilized until 80% of all lots are occupied um, or within four years of the issuance of the permit, whichever occurs first. That's currently what's stated in the ordinance today. Um, the proposed amendment would also create a provision for the building department to, for the, either the building department director or is designated to grant a one-time, one-year extension administratively so long as the minimum requirements are meant for the temporary building. Additional extensions granted beyond the one-year time frame would have to be, would have to come before the Board of Commissioners for approval. Applicants must apply for the one-time extension within 30 business days of the expired date of temporary structures 
and upon consulting with the building code, um, code enforcement department. Um, just a couple things to add since our last conversation in earlier, earlier this month. Um, building department staff has gone through and done some research regarding this matter and noted there were 450, as they, if they pull their, their research, 455 trailers that have been permitted since the year 2000. Um, of those, over 180 were classroom trailers. So right now we have roughly 275 permitted trailers since the year 2000. Obviously a really daunting number. Um, some of those have been removed. You know, we don't have a, a, a firm grasp of how many at this date have been removed, but we know some of them certainly have been. A lot, again, I, I, a lot of those were, were put in place during the, you know, when subdivisions were being built at a, at a, at a, at a fast pace. So a lot of them were, came up with the, during the construction of the subdivision and were subsequently removed. Some still have not. So I just wanted to give you some perspective on how many we've seen through over the course of the last 10 years. And again, what we would propose would be building department and code enforcement staff would kind of work in conjunction to um, go out, identify those that may still be still be out there that may be in violation of this particular code, and identify the appropriate parties and work to get the um, to get them into compliance. So, principally, you know, as stated, the the, the principal amendment would be the allowance of the one year extension um, administratively by the building department staff, and get anything beyond that would be at the uh, whim of the Board of Commissioners. Does any board member have a question or comment? Madam Chair. Mr. Holder. This is to Mr. Harris. Yeah, I know I don't reason I mentioned that. I'm sorry. In the executive summary, Mr. Harris, there's, and this is just a question, and I just want to be sure this is the right language. 80% of all lots are occupied by completed homes. Now, and I'm saying it is right after a second thought because you're saying the lot would have been occupied, not that the house was occupied, Correct. but the lot was occupied or it had been developed. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was my question, and, okay. and I, I got the answer as I was, as I was rethinking it. Thank you. A few things. In this economic times that we're in, are we the 80% I'm good with, but the time, I mean, is four years, is that good? I mean, this is kind of, I went out and looked at a few, few spots, and I know there's been some that's been out there a lengthy number of years, I mean, length of time. But, um, the way things are selling now is four years. I mean, is that is that a good benchmark for it? I mean, I, I, obviously it is. You wouldn't brought it up here, but I, I'm just concerned with that. Now, the 80% uh, being completed, I understand, and I would agree with that. Right, and, and, and as everyone knows, there's not a great deal of residential construction going on right now. Mm -hmm. At the time this was crafted, you know, I certainly would think that you know the subdivisions were being built out at a at a, at, a, at a very quick pace. Um, so typically, if subdivision builds out within 18 to 24 months, the trailer was being moved and typically being relocated to the next the next development. You know, over the course of the last two or three years, I mean, that's that's come to a halt. You know, so a lot of those subdivisions were kind of left some in, in, in at varying stages. I mean, some where they've gotten started and then construction start stopped. Some we have a, a number of developments where the streets and utilities are in. Construction trailer may have been moved out there, and then it stops. So there are no homes that have been built out there. You know, so we have everything up to the point where the majority of the homes have been built out, and there's still you know maybe remaining five ten percent of um, of the existing lots. So, you know, again, every every phase of the process is, is probably covered throughout. You know, as far as where construction trailers may well be located throughout the county. So typically, in good times, the subdivision is completed within 24 months? Yeah. yeah I think that's safe to say as on average, okay. depending on the size and number of lots. Any other questions from board members? If not, this is an advertised public hearing, and at this time I would like to ask if, the, if um, I believe we had a couple of folks that signed up specifically for this item. 
Um, those who wish to speak in favor of this ordinance, uh, um, this amendment to the ULDC, Melissa Jones has signed up to speak. And Ms. Jones, if you'd like to come forward. Good morning, Commissioners, Chairwoman. Um, I would like to reserve comments for um, public comment, but the only uh, question or comment I have about this um, amendment, we have questions on whether people will be grandfathered in on this. And also to address Commissioner Basler, um, although subdivisions are typically built maybe in 12 to 24 months, there are so many of those that Michael was addressing that have been out there for many, many years beyond the four to seven to ten years. And if a subdivision has come to a halt because of this economic time, the original thing that I had proposed to Mr. Harris that is not in this amendment is that if construction has halted for six months, maybe they could change it to a year, that trailer be moved so that those people that are fortunate enough to have moved into a development where construction has halted, that trailer's not sitting there left for them to look at while nothing is going on. This, the specific wording in this amendment at the beginning of the amendment is during the construction phase. A lot of these developments are not being constructed right now because the economy is so hard. So that's the question that I had was will this be grandfathered and uh, could we include language that it's moved after a specific time frame of no construction being done. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. We also had someone else who signed up to speak in reference to this particular item, um, Rod Oglesby of 106 North Ferry Street. Good morning. Good morning. I was here before and asked about extending the uh, permits for temporary units and subdivisions. And uh, I, I know the one that we have at Grove Point has been there a long time, but we have a lot of land down there. We still have 88 acres to develop one way or the other. The development that we had going, the permits have expired, so we don't know exactly which way we're going on it. We uh, used it as a center of our operation there. We were, have uh, put 125 families that have homes there, and that's their home. I don't disagree with this, except the 30-day, it has to be applied for within 30 days of when the, uh, the permit expired. If we do that, there, there are a lot of units out there where the permit has expired. We have tried to determine on ours when it expired, and we can't do it. We haven't been able to do it. I don't know whether the county's records show an expiration date or not. The builder's card on the unit does not have an expiration date. But anyway, uh, it's going to uh, put a hardship on a lot of builders, uh, even more than what we're uh, standing with the economy like it is. And uh, Henry County has always been friendly to builders and it was the basis of, of what has built Henry County. And uh, I think at this time we need some help and, uh, and uh, you all have the ability to control it as to how they look, how, how the grounds are kept, and uh, and so forth, and we just need some some extra time here to to get through these uh, tough economic times. And what I would like to see, instead of the the 30 days from the expiration of the permit, to be 30 days from uh, inst the date that this amendment goes into effect. If it could be changed to that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oglesby. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in reference to this item? All right, if not, um, does any other board member have a question or comment? You have a resolution before you. You can adopt it as has been presented by staff, or you can make whatever changes that you feel are appropriate. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. We have a motion by Mr. Holder to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? 
Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holder. Uh, if I might, and this may come back up later in the meeting or certainly at a different date, but I know that uh, Mr. Oglesby and Ms. Jones are certainly concerned with one particular subdivision. In this ordinance, we don't need to get confused about what this ordinance does as far as it, it certainly Grove Point subdivision will apply. Uh, this ordinance will apply to Grove Point subdivision. But the circumstances in, in Grove Point are certainly different from what we are addressing today in this one. Uh, and I'm sure that will end up being handled through code enforcement or through Mr. Harris's office. Uh, so I just want you to know that don't get confused with the two because you can't, when we're doing an, uh, an ordinance, it is not specific to a particular site or a particular development. It's all over this county. And as we had talked about earlier in the meeting with Shane and in, in, in his graciousness to be fair to all employees, I certainly want this ordinance to be fair to all builders and to all neighborhoods. If, if in fact, uh, Mr. Oglesby is required to, to remove his uh, structure, then I want to be fair in the fact that every person in violation or every developer throughout this county is required the same, of the same thing. Just a fairness issue. That's all I ask. And I just want to, I just want to make that point clear. Thank you. The next item is a public hearing request to amend Chapter 7, Section 7.04.07I, Home Occupation Signs of the Unified Land Development Code, and that's going to be Exhibit Number 7. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board again. Um, this text amendment is regarding home occupation signs. Currently, the Unified Land Development Code only allows one non-illuminated professional business um, nameplate um, for residents who have a home occupation and it's limited to two square feet in area. What staff is proposing is to amend the ordinance to allow for home occupations um, outside of a subdivision zoned RA with a minimum of two acres to be allowed to have a 16 square foot sign with a maximum height of six feet. Um, this sign would be permanent in nature and it still would have to adhere to all of the sign regulations and sign permitting process. We also want to amend the current provision which allows for the one non-illuminated professional nameplate and allow for a wall sign not to exceed two square feet in size and to have one stake sign which would be under eight square feet for those residents um, who are who don't meet the RA um, standards which are the RA outside of a subdivision minimum two acres. If you should have any questions I'll be glad to answer. Mr. Bowman. Just a clarification with the in, in a subdivision that has covenants. The covenants would override this, correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Mr. Uh, Holder. What is the significance of two acres? Uh, why? And I understand anything outside of subdivision. Because there are sub subdivisions that have two acres, too. But if it is a subdivision, it's excluded at that point. You couldn't do it anyhow, even if you had five in a subdivision, correct? That is correct. All right. As a, for instance, along a state route or a county route uh, at a corner uh, intersection, which we have them all over the county, and somebody owns one acre on the corner, a house in one acre, totally out of a subdivision, but they just happen to own one acre. My question is, and I'm sure there's a reason for it, but what is the significance of two acres? I think two acres was just the magic number because you're exactly right. There are a number of subdivisions that are, are that are along state routes or along major thoroughfares that are one acre in size. And what staff didn't want to do is to get into a situation where we have sign after sign after sign. So two acres was just the magic number. There's really no significance to it, but just to be able to distinguish between. Now, currently, even if you are... RA outside of a subdivision, you still would be allowed to have a sign. It would just be a stake sign and a nameplate or my, wall sign. That's my point. Okay, what provision can be put in if I owned an acre and, one, uh, acre and three quarter, we'll say, and uh, I didn't quite make that threshold, but you couldn't ride down the road and tell if I had an acre and three quarters or two acres. What? How could I 
get it done because according to this ordinance you can't because it's less than two acres. What would happen, there's two, two, two things have to happen. Whenever you come in and submit a sign application to planning and zoning, we require you to provide a letter of ownership. And in this case, because if you're saying that you're RA and you're meeting the two acre minimum, we would require you to provide some type of survey to, to be able to pr prove to us that you do have the two acres. If you want to do it and you don't meet the two acre requirement, you can still submit your sign application. We can deny it and then they can file an appeal which would come directly to the Board of Commissioners. And then you all would have the authority either to overturn our denial or to uphold the denial. And I understand that, but again, that's putting a citizen through more hoops, having to jump through more hoops, cost, more costly to get this, this done. And, and that's the reason for my question. What is the significance and why is it two acres? Because if you own a, a one acre lot on a corner, or, and I'm just using it on the corner, it could be anywhere, it could be along any route. And I understand you don't want a row of signs, but what, the, what if, uh, if a guy or a lady had an in-home beauty shop, in-home barber shop, I mean, we see them all the time, in-home pet groom. All of that, those are, those are home occupation businesses that are scattered throughout the county. But they wanted the exposure of a four by four sign rather than a yard sign. Mm -hmm. there, there is absolutely no, it was just the magic number for staff, the two acres. Um, Again, the one acre could be fine. I think the whole idea was to keep it out of subdivisions. Okay, well, so this, I think that's what the, it's clear in here that it says <laughs> anything out, <coughs> out, any, says it uh, outside of a subdivision. R A uh, zoning district outside of a subdivision, and it could say a minimum of one acre, two acres, ten acres. You could make that number whatever, and that's why I asked the question: What yes, is sir. the significance of it? I would. I would like to see one acre put into that. That's just my opinion, because I know there are so many homes that cannot, that have home occupations that need the exposure, that won't be able to qualify because they don't have the, the uh, size lot to require, to allow it, excuse me. Just to follow up a little bit, I'd like Commissioner Holder um, speaking about, I know the, in, the intention is to keep from having a row of signs down down a thoroughfare. Um, and my question is, was any thought given to road frontage as far as what size sign could be there based on the amount of road frontage? Because you have an area of the county, it's actually in Mr. Holder's district, where it's flag lot after flag lot after flag lot. And they may possibly have two acres, but only 50 feet of road frontage. And, and again, if you had signs of this size just steadily down that road, it would certainly be an eyesore, I would think. And I, through I agree with you. And that was one thing that we didn't look at. It was just acreage, the minimum acreage size. But that is definitely something that we can, if you all want to approve this um, ordinance amendment, we could, again, we'll have to throw out a magic number on what would be ideal um, for it. Currently, and I guess we would basically be talking about existing lots that are already developed because a lot of them already have um, minimum road frontage requirements, but for any new lots, there would be that minimum um, requirement. So that is something that we can definitely, if you all want to throw out a number, that'll be fine. Any other questions or comments? All right, at this time, um, since this is a public hearing, I'd like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item. If not, I'll look to the board for a motion on this item. Madam Chair, I move to approve with the amendment that I was speaking of, make going from two acres to one acre. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Holder to approve by changing that from two acres to one, and a second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Question. Mr. Stamey? Ms. Toto, would you be willing to put a minimum square footage on that in case it did fall into the category of a flag lot? Well, the, the problem with the flag lot, I think it's going to be an issue that's going to have to come back, is the fact that most flag lots can't be less than two acres. And, uh, you see, a flag lot's two acre minimum in here, even in the old plan. Is that not correct? That's correct. I think for RA, the minimum lot width is 175. So you would right. It's 175 for a regular lot, but even the flag lot was a minimum two acres. So there should not be a flag lot that exists less than two acres. So this would prohibit it on the flag lot in, in just in that respect. Is that not correct? You would still 
if you say the one acre minimum, then if you have no. two acres, three acres, you sure. can land. I mean, I understand that. I understand that. But uh, as far as road frontage 3060, I think that's going to have to be addressed at a different one because if you got a 30 foot easement, or you got a 30 foot easement on the flag lot, and you got a guy next door that's got an acre and a quarter, and the guy in the back owns the hair salon, and you can, you could literally have two signs look like they're on the same parcel. You could. Mm -hmm. There's and, no question. Um, I would like to. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I'd like to see a minimum um, road frontage foot footage put in there. I mean, I don't know if that number's 100. I don't know if it's 125 or whatever. Just, just point of clarification is uh, I think that's, that you could get it. That's a valid question, and I'm, I don't mind uh, incorporating it into this motion. I, I will amend my motion to, to approve that, but I don't know. Again, we look at magic numbers. I don't know what that is. In RA, but like she said, an RA with the exception of flag lots, and I don't know, and I have to defer to the county attorney as far as excluding somebody because of a flag lot is, is, is a legitimate legal lot just like anything else, and it's not today. Uh, but it, but it I, think we have, yeah, I think, Commissioner Holder, we will have, um, and I, Sherry may be able to identify more of these than I am able to right now, but... We have legitimate basis for treating flat lots a little differently sometimes just because of the unique nature of the shape. So if we wanted to make a distinction with respect to these signs based on the frontage requirements, I think that's perfectly legitimate and acceptable to do okay. that. Then, uh, do you, you're saying then it would be legitimate if we said that uh, one acre lot with a minimum 100 foot frontage? I do. You do? An R2 subdivision could give you anywhere between 50 to 75 feet. No, no, no. This is not no, allowed. This, I'm just okay. basing that number. We're looking for that magic number to incorporate into the ordinance. Uh, I, I think I could support 100 feet. I, 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 would, I would have to question it from the other side. Let's say I've got a flag lot and I've got three and a half acres and I'm off the road and I repair lawnmowers for a living. You know, what better place to do it than three and a half acres where nobody can actually see it than I'm on a flag lot. Is it fair to me that because I live on a flag lot that I can't have a sign in front of my place to let people know that I own a barber shop, a beauty shop, a lawnmower repair place? Would that be fair? I don't, I don't, I don't think that would be... Uh, I think it's when you're within the board's discretion, I think it would be a legitimate distinction if the board wanted to impose that condition. But I do think it's a balancing factor, and, and all the concerns that each member has expressed are valid concerns <coughs> to consider. Um, but it boils down to your legislative discretion on this issue. Let me ask you something, Sherry. Sure, if that person he's referring to wanted to do that, they still could come before the board and apply for a variance, couldn't they? And that's, you're exactly right. I think in that case, that would be the true purpose of a variance because the hardship would be the topography of, of that lot, the layout of that lot, so that would be a variance request. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Holder, would you like to amend your motion to add that condition? I would. All right. You well, I second that. You'll amend. Who had the second? I'm you sorry. had the second. Would you like to amend your second? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any further discussion on this item? All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And the final item under planning and zoning is a resolution requesting approval of the second revision of the project framework agreement. And um, our presenter is going to be Sherry Hobson Matthews, Director of Planning and Zoning, and Rocky Romero, Sploss Transportation Director, and that's exhibit number eight. Okay. Um, good morning, um, Madam Chair and Board. Again, um, this is a project framework agreement um, that was submitted by GDOT in September of this year. Well, we actually received one in September of 08. Um, we have since received another revised project framework agreement, and this is for the intersection improvement at State Route 42 in Harris Drive. Um, Rocky will kind of get into some details on the actual cost that's going to be associated with this project, but the difference in this project framework agreement and previous framework agreements is the preliminary engineering cost um, that the county's commitment has changed, and then the construction cost from the previous county commitment has changed. 
Um, right now, the estimated county commitment for preliminary engineering is $100,000, and then the estimated um, construction cost is 104 to 38. So if you should have any questions, myself or Rocky will be happy to answer. Does any board member have a question or comment? Mr. Bowman. Did you say the construction cost was 104? That's going to be the local commitment. The total construction cost is 521-190. I'm sorry? The total construction cost is estimated at 521-190. And one thing I failed to mention is this was part of a congressional earmark um, from Congressman Westmoreland's office. So the federal portion is taking care of a lot of the construction. Okay, thank you. Just comment, Madam Chair. Mr. Holder. This morning, it's ironic, but this morning there was a bad wreck with Highway 42 blocked. Anybody that was headed that way uh, got involved in that uh, at this particular intersection. So it, there's no question. There have been fatalities there. It needs to be, needs to be done. Uh, explain again what our portion of this is because it's changed. Uh, I know when it came down from Congressman Westmoreland, this road and also Lake Dow was funded, and it was to the, about a half million in each one, and it has dropped considerably over the years. PFA, uh, the, basically it's a 100% federal earmark. There's no GDOT participation, so it's federal money and Henry County money. Uh, the federal has paid for the part of the design, which is uh, $15,000. Uh, the county is, is to reimburse GDOT for the, for the rest of that. Uh, right away is completely Henry County. Utilities, Henry County, and then construction, uh, participation, 20% of, of the bid. Uh, of course, uh, the federal participation is, is that maximum shown in, in, in the screen. So anything above that, Henry County is uh, responsible. Anything over the 521 is Henry County's. Is that correct? That's, That's correct. correct. Um, just to note, those are federal funds, Henry County funds, and that's along a state route, US 23 Federal, Georgia 42, with no GDOT funding. Is that not correct? That's correct. That's correct. Anything over 416. We're putting 20 in it already. Yeah. Any other comments on this item? Have y'all, uh, there was also supposed to be a $25,000 contribution by a property owner at that intersection has Henry County requested that? Not yet, uh, Madam Chairman, because uh, we st we have not gone into the right way. We started doing the pre-acquisition, but not which is doing the data books and all that. But we we actually Sherry sent me that information last week, so we have it, and uh, we'll definitely get that twenty-five thousand. Okay, great. Well, if there's no further questions from the board, you have. Um, Mr. Holder, I'll entertain a motion from you for the revised project framework agreement. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. The next item under SPLOST is a resolution requesting award of a bid for the construction of the widening and paving of Mackey Road and Stallsworth Road. Our presenters, Rocky Romero, SPLOST Transportation Project Director, Exhibit Number 9. Good morning again. Uh, Mackey, Mackey Road and Star Wars Road is a designated SPLOS 3 transportation project. We have combined these two projects into one due to their proximity. Mackey Road is located from Keys Ferry Road to Star Wars Road, and Star Wars Road is located fr from the end of payment to Sandy Ridge uh, Road. Seal bids were solicited for the construction of winding and paving of this road. Eleven seal bids were received and reviewed. Staff recommends the low beater Lambert Sand and Gravel Company in the amount of one million three hundred seventy six thousand three hundred ninety five dollars and eighty six cents. Funding for this project is available within the project budget. Senior board member have a question or comment? 
If not, Mr. Holder, this lies in your district, and I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve, Madam Chair. Have a motion to approve. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item is a resolution requesting approval of an agreement for professional engineering services for the realignment and improvements at the intersection of State Route 42 at Harris Drive. That's exhibit number 10. Uh, as mentioned earlier, this project has a federal earmark uh, funding. Uh, Georgia DOT is responsible for the design uh, but due to their workload, they, has re they have requested Henry County to assist in uh, completing the, the design work. Uh, with this resolution, Professional Engineering Services uh, from McGee Partners Incorporated will provide a technician to finalize the construction plans for the project. Uh, right now, we are into final plans. Uh, we're going to be requesting final field plan review in a week or two. And any comments, any additional in design work to be done, uh, this is what we're requesting uh, for Maggie Partners to complete. Uh, and uh, the amount for this work is not to exceed $25,000. Are there any questions or comments pertaining to this item? If not, this lies in Commissioner Holder's district, and I'll look for a motion to approve an agreement between um, Henry County and McGee Partners. Move to approve, Madam Chair. Have a motion to approve. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item is a resolution requesting approval of an increase in cost for the installation of Leland Cypress trees and Loblolly pine trees along McDonough Parkway Extension, and that's exhibit number 11. Uh, Silbies were solicited for the installation of the Leland Cypress and the Lob Lolly Pine Trees along McDonough Parkway Extension. Uh, on August the 3rd, 2010, the board approved a bid award for the installation of these trees uh, to the low bidder Rockland Contracting LLC uh, with stipulations that the tree would not be planted until October 1st, 2010. Uh, due to the two-month waiting period for the installation of the trees, the supplier for Rockland Contracting has increased the unit price an additional $1,450. Uh, the original amount, bid amount was $12,380. Uh, and just to, as a note, the second low bidder originally was $18,278.75. And uh, we do have the money within, within the budget of the project. Mr. Bowman. Yeah, this is uh, just a, a comment that we, we did ask that, that uh, we put that off. And the other thing is when you look at the amount of trees, there's, there's 100 Leland Cypress and 50 of uh, the Lob Lolly Pines. And that's, a to that's the right numbers, aren't they? That, that's correct. So, I mean, basically you're talking about, you know, approximately less than $10 a tree for this charge of being, you know, holding off on putting them. So. I don't think that, from, from my standpoint, I don't think that's bad. So. My, my question again, I guess, would be why in the world would you use a loblolly pine <clears throat> as a buffer tree? Uh, I cannot understand. As, as I mentioned earlier on the previous meeting, I think it was more of the property owner or the subdivision, uh, they wanted different trees, different. Varieties to so they don't. To they, really, they really don't want a sound barrier or blind or anything <clears throat> like that because well, the uh, lolly pines just be one pole sticking straight up. up, straight up. Never understood it. But if that's their wishes, I mean, you know, I don't know for what purpose. Any other questions? I have a comment or a question, Latanya. We haven't even started this project, and we had an increase on it. Are we within our legal confinements to do this, or do we need to rebid the whole process? In most of our bids, there is a, a specified time frame that the um, vendor can be held um, committed to the award submitted. I believe that that time expired in this instance. So because we're outside of that time frame, we either go back and do an increase, or we can rebid. And I don't know if the cost would justify Either way, being fourteen hundred dollars, whether it would cost us more so. money to go through that process or not, and something management will have to make make a determination of. Yeah, looking at the second low bidder, previously it was 
over five thousand dollars more. So I think if, if we go back to rebid, it's probably going to cost more. Don't rebid. Don't rebid. We're having some advice from the experts down here. Okay, I'll listen. I would definitely not repeat it. Uh, the, what's, what you've got now is all the other numbers are out. They're public information. You rebid it. The, you know, if, if I'm the low bidder, my price is probably going up to about seventeen thousand dollars because I'm going to be right up under that number two bidder. That's right. It's like the the price is right. Yeah. But you know what the other guys? Bid. What about the other guys? They're going to come right underneath the thirteen. Well, think about this: the guy that goes low. Is using is taking an opportunity to actually raise the price, but yet, as uh, Mr. Romero said, he's still several thousand dollars under the second bidder. So I don't know what I'd rebid. Okay. Well, question. My question is: back in August, when we talked about postponing this. I believe Randy made or said that we needed to prolong it a little bit because of the hot weather. Were they notified then, in fact, that we was going to do this, or did that go unnoticed and? How we're just arbitrarily charged with another fourteen hundred dollars. That's my question. That's that's a different department that does that. I don't do that. I don't I'll have to verify it with them. Well it seems like maybe we have either dropped the ball or didn't dot over uh, cross all our teeth. I asked you the same question, I think. Yeah. That, that's just a question because I, I, I remember this and we had talked about because it was so dry and what we was gonna do, we wasn't gonna start until a certain date. <laughs> now, if they weren't notified, I could see why they'd probably want to go up or, or they may have a, a supply issue or something. Right. But if they was notified that we was that this was our intentions, then I'm, my question is, what's up with I mean, they were They were verbally notified through the SPLOS office, but we never received anything from them in writing until we received actually the facts with amounts. Uh, the issue would be the, time, the contract time. Right. I mean, he could literally walk away from it all again. Legally, he could walk away from it unless it's specified in there that he's under contract for that period of time. So, you know, if you want to get down to it, I mean, we're the one that caused the understand. issue by putting it off. If we would have went ahead and went along with our contract provisions that stated that he would put them in by a certain time, whatever that was, it's, it's, uh, it's not him. It's well, I understand, it. I understand it, but if we in fact had contacted him and he had came back and said that that would be, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't go to, um, you know, honor it. But that's just, I don't know, don't let me get off on the wrong foot, but I'm just saying that were, were they not notified to, for what our intentions was? I don't know if they were notified in writing, but I know I called it, the, the owner of the company and yes. mentioned it to him, uh, and it was not until September... Uh, Mr. Bowers. It was until September the 10th that we received an email, and we didn't receive anything in, in writing with the amount that he was going to go up until October 5th. At the end of the day, we are the ones that didn't uh, didn't stand up to what we said we were going to do to begin with. It, it appears well, to you be. have the option to rebid it if that's what you feel like I you want to do. I'm not so sure that'd be the thing that we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> you either got to pay it or rebid it. I'd say we. <laughs> it's pretty simple. I'd say we pay it myself. Well, and this and going forth in the future, when we have issues like this, where we're planting these types of trees, we know the optimal time is going to be October, November, or February, March, April. And so, if we're in those time frames, maybe in the future, when we bid these out, we'll put a provision in there that that will be the date that they will be installed. Well, definitely. And then we won't have this issue again. We'll definitely learn from this one, Matt, I'm sure. Okay. Now that we've spent more time talking about these trees than anything else this morning, um, Mr. Staney, I will entertain a motion. Move to approve with the increase. Have a motion to approve. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Well, you, you know okay. what I need. Go ahead. Oh, you were asking me earlier about uh, can I give a, <clears throat> an update on the McDonald Parkway? Yes, uh, we have it flashing finally, so we, we went into flashing last Wednesday. Uh, we'll have it operational hopefully this Wednesday if everything works. We should be okay, everything working fine. So road is also going to be open on Wednesday too. So just to let everybody know that we'll have uh, 
the signal operational and the road, the McDonough Parkway road open. Uh, so the, that will be on Thursday, the ribbon cutting. <laughs> um, we want to we wanna make sure that, that everything is, we don't know at what time GDOT is going to come in to, to cut the, uh, turn on the light on. So, uh, so it's going to be sometime Wednesday. It could be in the morning, mid-morning, mid-afternoon. So, uh, but it's definitely going to be open once the barrels are out of the way and, and the signal is working. That's when it's going to be open to the road. Traffic. Thank you, Rocky. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a resolution requesting approval of a budget amendment regarding the Locust Grove Senior Center. And our presenter is Ron Burkhalter, Capital Projects Director, and that's handout number one. Good morning. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. The Locust Grove Senior Center is an approved and designated SPLOS 3 project. The Locust Grove Conference Center was purchased for use as the Locust Grove Senior Center. Funding is needed to cover the construction costs to convert the existing building for use as a senior center in the amount of $200,000. Funding is available to be transferred from Sandy Ridge Park to Locust Grove Senior Center account. Both of these accounts are District 1 SPLOS 3 projects. Funds totaling $200,000 from SPLOS 2 will be designated for Sandy Ridge Park to replace the transfer of the SPLOS 3 funds. And this particular project has no loblolly pines on it. <laughs> Does any board member have a question or comment? Mr. Bowman? I, I, I just have a question. Is, is what is, what's the you're moving $200,000, but I don't see what you're doing with $200,000. The $200,000 of SPLOS $3 are coming out of Sandy Ridge going to the Senior Center and replacing the $200,000 from Sandy Ridge with SPLOS $2. So the net sum at Sandy Ridge will be zero. Right. I, I, I understand what you're moving. I, I, what I, the, I, the reasoning behind it is okay. this. Sandy Ridge Park it was a splash two, two and, and three. three project. So we couldn't take two hundred thousand dollars from Splash Two and move it to the senior center at Locust Grove because it was not identified as a Splash Two project. It was only a Splash Three. So we had to take money from Splash from Sandy Ridge and three and bring it back to Locust Grove and replenish that money with Splash Two money to take it back to Sandy Ridge so that neither one uh, had a deficit in their budget. Is that not correct, Ron? That's correct. I'm, my question was, though, is... When did Splash 2 money came No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. No, no the only thing I was questioning was, uh, you, is, is there a use, do you have a defined use for the $200,000? At the senior center? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes. The flooring and all of the improvements that they did. So when we bought the center, we only got enough money to purchase to buy the center, but not to do the renovation that was necessary. So this is going towards the renovation. Absolutely. And, but the, I thought uh, the kitchen, we were talking about the kitchen at one time. And you and I talked about it, and I didn't know if this was this is the, the kitchen the, or part of the kitchen. It's part of its kitchen, flooring, downstairs, renovation. Oh, I had no problem with the, with the moving of it. I was getting a little confused where it was going. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> questions or comments? If not, um, there's a resolution for you. Mr. Holder, I'll look to you for a motion. Move to approve. Motion to approve. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to technology services, a resolution requesting approval of an agreement for consulting services for the development of a public safety plan for a 700 megahertz network. Our presenter is Clark Rayner, Director of Technology Services. That's handout number two. Good morning. Good morning. Um, shortly after 9-11, post-mortem was conducted on the first responders' ability to respond to that disaster uh, that happened in New York back in, in 2001. One of the main things that came out of that, uh, that we learned from that disaster, was the inability for interoperable communications between the various first responders. Um, firemen were not able to speak with policemen. We're not able to speak with state and federal authorities. 
and basically everybody was on a different system. No one could communicate across uh, the radio waves. And in response to that, in 2007, uh, the FCC um, determined that one of the ways to address this was to free up some of the airwaves that existed in the UHF spectrum on your television. And that was the switch to digital television. Um, fast forward again to May 12th of 2010, and the FCC issued an order which basically blocks off a piece of that spectrum um, specifically for a nas national public safety network for data communications. Um, and they also, along with that order, they basically set a standard up that this is the standard nationally that will be used for public safety communications moving forward. Um, on September the 15th of this year, um, Henry County, along with uh, three other counties uh, and areas in Georgia, filed a waiver petition, which is basically an application with the FCC to obtain that license spectrum, um, which again is, is set aside specifically for public safety. And um, that, that has gone through, I believe we're supposed to be hearing back from uh, that waiver petition as uh, it goes out for public comment or was, has been out for public comment, we should hear back uh, this week whether we actually get that or not, which it's, it's, it's almost a done deal that we're going to get that. Uh, it's something that uh, has been awarded to, I believe, 21 other agencies thus far. This is the second round of waiver petitions that have gone out. And, again, we expect to, to hear back and, and be awarded that waiver uh, this year. And we do the same thing for the 800 megahertz spectrum that our radio system in the county currently does. We also have a, a license for 4.9 and a few other uh, smaller spectrums. Uh, however, this, uh, this is unique. The 700 megahertz radio spectrum is unique in that if you were able to get a television signal on your UHF dial, um, if everybody remembers what a dial was on a TV, um, it has the ability to penetrate through buildings and loblolly pine trees and <laughs> dirt mounds and, and other things much more better than, um, uh, than the current radio spectrum does. Uh, it's basically, it's much more capable of handling that mission critical work that our first responders do throughout the county. And what we're asking for today is uh, to enter into a uh, consulting services agreement with Rural Broadband LLC. Um, basically to complete, complete a business plan, complete a, um, the engineering work, and get us to the point where we can look at some federal funding. Um, because this is something new and it's something that the FCC is, is pushing, um, there's actually uh, several bills in Congress right now. Um, both, there's one in the House and there's one in the Senate. Both are, um, have bipartisan support. The one in the Senate, for instance, is supported by McCain and Lieberman. Um, and uh, the two bills that are out there now basically are going to set aside close to $12 billion to jumpstart this interoperable radio system throughout the country. Um, we want to be prepared to take advantage of those funds as they become available, and we believe that the prudent thing to do is to move forward with this um, design work up front so that we can take advantage of those as those funds do become available. Um, I'd be happy to ask any, answer any questions that you may have. Um, we've also got some members of the uh, public safety community here. I do want to make a point that they've been involved in this process up front. Um, various levels of, of organizations, such as police as a National Fire Chiefs Association, uh, the major cities police chiefs, they are, uh, have been lobbying heavy in support of these bills as well and in this effort. Um, again, I'd like to take any questions that you may have. And any board member have a question? Just a quick question. Clark, um, in this next wave of, of federal funding, that will be similar in nature to the $44 million or whatever that North Georgia got in the first round. Is that correct? Uh, let me, let's be very clear about this. These are not stimulus dollars. Okay. This is completely new funding, new funding. Com coming from a completely different funding avenue. Um, this, is, this is being promoted by the FCC. Not by, Not by the Department of Commerce or by the RUS, uh, Rural uh, Utility Service, I believe. Rural Utility Service. That's right. The, 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 RUS, the RUS grants and the NTIA grants 
Right. Uh, there was basically two sides of the stimulus for the broadband before, and that was one was from the Department of Com Commerce, the other was from uh, the Russ. Okay. Okay. This will be coming from a whole different. So. Totally different. Good. They're not stimulus dollars. Any other questions, Mr. Roark? I think I know the answer to this, but just uh, for the record, I think you may have alluded to it, but you've already you've gotten with all of our top public safety people, 911, fire, police, and all that, and they all have given feedback that this is the way to go, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, as well as the county manager's office. Um, and, again, we're not in this alone. It's, it's uh, this, this particular application that we've made includes not only our agency, but uh, there's, there's four other agencies um, in this, this particular way. The, the actual way that we, we entered into the waiver petition will easily allow for other counties and cities to come on board as well in Georgia. Um, the FCC has been very specific, however, in that they do not want this to be a state project. They want this to be a, um, a, local, a local effort. Um, instead of going through the normal channels that you would with the Department of Public Safety, for instance, where the state typically takes their 20% cut and then passes you what's left. And one more question is for you or for the county manager, but do we know exactly where the $48,000 will come from? The $40,000 will have to come from a, uh, from a budget amendment. Um, Mike Bush can tell you that uh, um, our revenues it, this budget year are down, but our expenditures are down further, where there is some flexibility for a budget amendment to pay for this consulting contract. Yeah. Any other questions, yeah. Mr. Baslin? That's my question right there is about the, uh, the budget. I mean, can we afford to do this right, right now? I know the importance of it, and we're not talking about fiber optic as, as like we had been, uh, months ago on issues, but with the public safety and all that, I understand, but is this the time that we can we, I mean, that's what's concerning me. Is uh, We are currently um, in a, uh, you know, the revenues are slightly below projected revenues, but they always are in July and August, and coming into September, October, when you start collecting your taxes. Our expenditures are, however, further down than they were, you know, we, we cut our budgets we kept them very tightly, and as we said before, we're going to continue to watch everything we spend. We came up here a few days ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and talked to you about how we had anticipated using seven and a half million dollars of fund balance and only used three and a half or four million, saving three and a half million dollars in last year's budget. Things like that is where this type of funding would come from. It's, it's through savings, whether it be in the current year, which we have savings in this current year, or whether it be through that savings of fund balance in the past. And we're not obligated to nothing. Is that what we're, we're saying? We're not obligated to anything. This is basically, this would be akin to doing the design work in a road construction project. Basically getting the design work done up front just so that we have some answers in terms of how much it's going to cost, what the technology is that needs to be used. Um, it's, it's really being prepared. Um, you know, to, to move for further if, in fact, that's what's warranted once. It's, we really need more information right now, and this, this study will certainly help give us that. And I can, I'd like to also add for the commissioner's, uh, chair and commissioner's benefit, um, when I got involved with this uh, initiative, uh, it gave me great comfort to see the, uh, our entire uh, public safety lineup, fire, police, EMA, uh, be 100 percent behind this program and we would not have brought this proposal if the if the timing were not very very good the opportunity for grant funding excellent and uh, um, and, and a team put together that has truly has excellent contacts and uh, great knowledge in this area and it also would not have been brought forward if the budget situation were not uh, slightly more positive than than where we were so I'd, I'd just like to add those those comments. Any other questions or comments pertaining to this item? If not, you have a resolution before you to um, approve and authorize the documents for the consulting services for the development of a public safety plan, and I will entertain a motion. Move. Motion by Mr. Holder, second. second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Please note that Mr. Bowman has recused himself from this vote. Thank you very much. 
All right, at this time, um, we need approval of the August 2nd and August 16th minutes. I made a couple of grammatical changes to both of those. Are there any other additions or corrections that need to be made? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Holder. Second, second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? The motion carries 5-0. At this time, we're moving into public comments. Citizens are allowed to voice county-related concerns, opinions, etc., that are not listed on the agenda, agenda during this portion of the meeting. And all persons will be given five minutes if you signed up with the county clerk prior to the meeting. And I believe uh, that, Ms. Jones, you did want to address the board during the public meeting um, portion of the meeting as well. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. I appreciate your indulgence in speaking with you again in regards to this matter. Um, I thank Mr. Harris and um, Sherry for working with me in the language on that amendment. Um, thank Mr. Holder for making sure that we were all aware that this was a fairness issue. It was not a specific issue in regards to Grove Point. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, in our situation, I wanted to just ask a question because on October 4th during the work session we would discuss this amendment. I then went home and had a conversation with a code enforcement gentleman and the language appeared to be ambiguous to him. I want to make sure that I'm interpreting it correctly so that he's interpreting correctly. Everyone knows that we're on the same page. Correct me if I'm wrong. This amendment does say that it's after four years, 80 percent, one-time extension within 30 days of that expiration period. There's no grandfather clause on that. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't, we didn't address, the orders didn't address anything regarding the grandfather clause. As it were, you know, we're stating that it, the requirement is the 30 days from the time of expiration, they would have to notify um, the building department in this case. Okay. And principally, that would apply to those new applications for construction trailers. I wanted to just make sure with Commissioner Holder that we were, because you had said this would not apply to our subdivision, this amendment, so we were going from original code. And I did want to address for the board and also for my homeowners during the public comments that the comments that Mr. Oglesby made um, could be interpreted incorrectly. He was saying that there was land behind Grove Point that could be developed. Um, I wanted to make clear because uh, Commissioner Basler had talked about how some of those subdivisions were not being completed within 12 to 24 months. They could be years out. That land behind Grove Point is due to be developed as a completely separate subdivision. And it could be years, if ever, if that land is developed. So I'm glad that this amendment will not affect the trailer in our subdivision looking at land that may be developed as a different subdivision. So thank you for your indulgence. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Normally we don't respond back here in public comment, but I just wanted to mention that is the reason that I had made the comment that in Mr. Um, Oglesby's, Oglesby's on, in his particular situation, that it would be handled either by code enforcement or Mr. Harris's office because that's the reason, not, not going directly in saying that Yours is, is a totally different situation. His is because we adopted the resolution that, that, that affected everybody in the county, not specifically his. So his will be handled either, uh, well, actually through code enforcement and uh, Mr. Harris. I understand. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. County Manager, any comments? No, ma'am. Ms. County Attorney? No, ma'am. Upcoming meetings and events tomorrow, October 19th at 6.30 p.m., we have a regular meeting. Monday, November 1st at 9 a.m., we have a workshop meeting. And Tuesday, November 2nd at 9 a.m., a regular meeting. Tuesday, November 2nd is Election Day. We encourage all registered voters to please go out and vote. And, of course, you can early vote between now and then as well. Those hours should be posted on the county website under the Elections Department. Thursday, November 11th, all county offices will be closed in observance of Veterans Day. And there are a number of Veterans Day celebrations going on throughout the county. Specifically, there will be one at Heritage Park. Please check the county website for more information. At this time, I need a motion to convene into executive session for the purposes of personnel, pending or potential litigation, and land acquisition. Okay. 
have a motion by Mr. Basler, second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. I need a motion to reconvene into public session. So motion by Mr. Stamey, second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. I need a motion for approval of an affidavit and resolution pertaining to executive session. Motion by Mr. Stamey. Second by Mr. Roark. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. At this time, we need to amend the agenda for three items. Mr. Roark? Yes. Um, I will move to approve a resolution to authorize the acquisition of 0.017 acres for right away, more or less, and 0.014 acres permanent easement, more or less, and 0 0.031 acres of temporary easement, more or less, and land lot 207 of the 6th District, Henry County, by negotiated contract or condemnation pursuant to provisions of OCGA section 32-3-4 through 32-3-19. And we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Madam Chairman, we'll approve, uh, make a motion to approve a resolution to authorize acquisition of 0.111 acres of right of way, more or less, and 0.125 acres of permanent easement, more or less, and 0 0.019 acres of temporary easement, more or less. Land lot 178 of the 6th District, Henry County, by negotiated contract or condemnation pursuant to provisions of OCGA section 32-3-4 through 32-3-19. We have a motion by Mr. Roark. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Move to approve a resolution to authorize the acquisition within parcel 46 of 0 .03, 0 0.369 acres of right of way, more or less, 0 0.099 acres of permanent easement, more or less, 0 0.0416 acres of temporary easement, more or less, 0 0.0116 acres of driveway easement, more or less, and to authorize the acquisition within parcel 47 of 0 0.022 acres of permanent easement, more or less. 0 0.007 acres of temporary easement, more or less, 0 0.007 acres of driveway easement, more or less, in land lot, land lot 178 of the 6th District, Henry County, Georgia, be negotiated contract or condemnation pursuant to provisions of OCGA section 32-3-4 through 32-3-19. have a motion by Mr. Roark. Is there a second? Second, second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. If there's no further business to come before this board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Roark. Second by Mr. Basler. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. We stand adjourned. <laughs>